To some, they stood for justice, freedom, and equality. To others, they are nothing more than a self-righteous, hypocritical group of capitalists that sold their product to the masses under the guise of protest and socialism. They made it clear from the very beginning that they wanted to be a voice for the voiceless, to be a politically active part of society and bring change to all of the evil that plagued the world around them. However, their commitment to this cause would come under heavy scrutiny when lead singer Zach De La Rocha would quit the group, leading to what many believe to be irreparable damage to their reputation. In the same year, they attempted to storm the New York Stock Exchange during the filming of their music video for the single Sleep Now in the Fire, directed by Michael Moore. The same Michael Moore behind the documentaries Bowling for Columbine, Trumpland, and Fahrenheit 9-11. They would release three albums between 1992 and the year 1999, all of which would be politically motivated with their debut record featuring an image so controversial in nature that to even show it on YouTube, it must be censored. All of these records were released on major labels, labels that are and always have been heavily invested in capitalistic marketing tactics, which led many to question how can a group of individuals supposedly focused on bringing awareness to the evils of capitalism profit so greatly from its rewards. This and many other contentious points raised throughout their career would ironically become the very downfall of the band itself. Keep your friends close, they say. This is Know Your Enemy, the story of Rage Against the Machine. All of which are American dreams! Noam Chomsky is an American professor born in 1928, and in 1999, Rage Against the Machine frontman Zach De La Rocha had the opportunity to sit down and interview him. This was somewhat of a dream come true for Zach. Noam Chomsky is revered as a great modern day intellect, one who is also known as the father of modern linguistics. An expert in the field of analytical philosophy, cognitive science, politics, and socio-economics. He is credited with revolutionizing the linguistics field by introducing the Chomsky hierarchy, generative grammar, and the concept of a universal grammar, which underlies all human speech and is based in the innate structure of the mind and brain. I want to make music that gives people that same sense of identity and lets them see that human rights, civil rights, and spiritual rights are all part of the same struggle we all face to take the power back. It's important to let people know not to lose that knowledge of self, to lose that knowledge of culture, but not to the point of separatism. Zach De La Rocha says Noam Chomsky's books are the reason he developed a better understanding of globalization and society. Globalization is a term used to describe how trade and technology have made the world into a more connected and interdependent place, and no doubt where Zach's political ideologies were influenced and formed, which as we all know, are essentially the bedrock foundation for Rage Against the Machine's very existence. Politically, Noam Chomsky aligns with libertarian socialism. By definition, this ideology is an anti-authoritarian and anti-capitalist political current that emphasizes self-governance and workers' self-management. This essentially means a free and equal society where workers retain control and capitalism is replaced with what is called cooperative economics, which also means the people own everything not the state, nor the government. There would be no traditional government. So now when you look at the album artwork for Rage Against the Machine's debut record, released in 1992, 
it may add a little more context as to what it actually is. For most people, it's just a cool album cover. It's an explosion of flames and what appears to be a burning man. However, this is not artwork. This is a genuine photograph of what was once a living human being. And for the people that watched this event unfold, it was very real. The photograph was taken on the 11th of June 1963, and the image is so graphic that it can't even be shown. It seemed Rage Against the Machine wanted to make the loudest political statement they possibly could from the get-go, not just with their lyrics, but also with imagery and symbolism. They wanted the world to know that it wasn't about the music, it was about the message. That message, however, would quickly be fraught with band members fighting, clashes with law enforcement, and ridicule at the very hypocrisy that Rage Against the Machine appeared to represent, using a capitalist system to spread an anti-capitalist message. Our story continues with Tom Morello, born Thomas Baptiste Morello, May the 30th, 1964, in New York City, an only child to a mother who was a schoolteacher and a father who became Kenya's first ambassador to the United Nations. So it's already easy to see why he developed an early interest in politics. When your father holds such a notable position within the United Nations, a diplomatic and political international organization whose stated purposes are to maintain international peace and security, then chances are you weren't eyeing up a career to be, say, a car salesman. Morello graduated from high school in 1982 and enrolled at Harvard University as a political science student. It appears that his chosen path was not only influenced by his political upbringing, but also from his own experiences of being a minority growing up in a small conservative town called Libertyville in America. It's an entirely white conservative northern suburb of Chicago, and I was the first person of color to reside in the town. My mum and I moved there in 1965. She was applying to be a public high school teacher in communities around the northern suburbs. In more than one of them, they said, you can work here, but your family cannot live here. They were explicit about it. I was a one-year-old half Kenyan kid and they told my mum, you're an interracial family, so you can live in the ghetto in Waikegan or go to North Chicago or somewhere like that. Morello joined his first band as a singer at age 13, a covers band before forming his own group called Electric Sheep in 1982. That actually featured Adam Jones of Tool on bass, although he became a guitar player. Jones was also raised in Libertyville. Morello's early musical influences included Kiss, Iron Maiden, Alice Cooper, and Led Zeppelin. He also stated that Tony Iommi of Black Sabbath was his go-to guitarist when it came to writing riffs. He would graduate from Harvard in 1986 with a degree in social studies, where he then decided to move to Los Angeles. Before Rage Against the Machine though, he was struggling to even find work and he had to take a job as an exotic dancer of all things. My ambition was to be a revolutionary. But how do you become a revolutionary, especially when you're living in a sleepy little place like Libertyville? I thought the best way to arm myself was to get the best education I could. When I graduated from Harvard and moved to Hollywood, I was unemployable. I was literally starving, so I had to work menial labor, and at one point, I even worked as an exotic dancer. I did bachelorette parties, and I'd go down to my boxer shorts. Would I go any further? All I can say is thank God it was in the time before YouTube. You could make decent money doing that job. In 1989, Morello joined a funk metal group called Lockup. They only released one album via Geffen Records before disbanding in 1990. And the following year, Tom Morello would form Rage Against the Machine. Music 
Tom Morello would write his first political song in junior high, and it was called Salvador Death Squad Blues, which was presumably about the far-right paramilitary death squads that were in operation in El Salvador during the Salvadorian Civil War throughout the 1980s. With Morello being so interested in making political statements, why didn't he just go into politics? After all, he had enrolled at Harvard University as a political science student. While it turns out he actually worked in the office of United States Senator Alan Cranston for a brief time. But it didn't quite turn out to be the revolutionary career path he was hoping for. The fact that 80% of my time I spent with the senator, he was on the phone asking rich people for money. It just made me understand that the whole business was dirty. He had to compromise his entire being every day. A woman phoned up to the office and wanted to complain that there were Mexicans moving into her neighborhood. I said to her, ma'am, you're a damn racist, and she was indignant. I thought I was representing our cause well, but I got yelled at for weeks by everyone for saying that. I thought to myself that if I'm in a job where I can't call a racist a racist, then it's not for me. Not content working for the politically corrupt, Rage Against the Machine seemed to be the perfect outlet for his political passions. Morello would soon enlist the services of Zach De La Rocha on vocals, Tim Comerford on bass, and Brad Wilk on drums. Zach De La Rocha was born in California, January the 12th, 1970. He took an early interest in Jimi Hendrix, jazz musicians such as Charlie Parker, and would later turn his attention to punk music and punk culture, amongst other things. Iggy Pop and the Stooges, MC5, Public Enemy, and Run DMC would be some of his biggest influences. Zach, however, being of Mexican heritage, felt out of place from a young age. There was a deep sense of frustration and alienation I experienced growing up in a very conservative community. A very racist conservative community. And I think that's what initially attracted me to punk music. I grew up breakdancing, I grew up playing punk rock music, I grew up listening to it. It spoke to me in a way that no other music up to that point could speak to me. It would appear that Zach and Tom both shared similar experiences being raised in America, so it would come as no surprise the pair would bond over this when they started jamming together. And before long, the first Rage Against the Machine political statement would hit the shelves. November 3rd, 1992, Rage Against the Machine released their debut record, and it would be self-titled. Initially, the record only landed in the Billboard Heatseekers chart, a chart specifically reserved for new and emerging artists. However, with Killing in the Name and Bullet in the Head being powerful singles, the album was pushed to number 45 on the official Billboard 200. Killing in the Name is arguably one of the most recognizable songs of the 90s. Even if you weren't into metal or hard rock, there's a good chance you'd be headbanging to this in your car on the way to work, screaming, F you, I won't do what you tell me. It was without doubt a song of rebellious meaning to many, but what was the real reasoning for this simple lyric? While it's a simple lyric, I think it's one of Zach's most brilliant, and to me, it relates to Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass said the moment he became free was not the moment that he was physically loosed from his bonds. It was the moment when Master said yes, and he said no. And that's the essence of you, I won't do what you tell me. And that's why it's encouraging to hear it shouted at the Fed goons who were shooting tear gas at American citizens. So who was Frederick Douglass? Well, he was a slave, though he managed to escape in 1838 and essentially became an activist and social reformer. 
He became the most important leader of the movement for African American civil rights in the 19th century. And lyrically, it was pretty clear that some of those that work forces are the same that burn crosses was an implication that people within a position of power, whether it be police authorities or government officials, were either racist or directly linked to the KKK. Probably the most infamous white supremacist group ever founded on American soil. It's also important to note that Rage released this record on the same day as the 1992 United States presidential election, whereby Democrat Bill Clinton won his campaign and became the 42nd president of the United States of America, defeating Republican George Bush, who held the position previously. Just another way Rage wanted people to know they were serious about making political statements. It's important for me as a popular artist to make clear to the governments of the United States and Mexico that despite the strategy of fear and intimidation to foreigners, despite their weapons, despite their immigration laws and military reserves, they will never be able to isolate the Zapatista communities from the people in the United States. Here, Zach is talking about his support for a far-left Mexican national liberation group that he was very publicly vocal about. The group were labeled as libertarian socialists and also anarchist, which is how Rage Against the Machine saw themselves. They wanted to disrupt the systems that had been built around them. However, it seemed that even their political passions for justice weren't as strong as they hoped maybe the public would perceive them to be. They allegedly fought so violently amongst themselves that they briefly broke up, regrouping in June, shortly before the K-Rock weenie roast. In a recent interview with Kerrang, guitarist Tom Morello didn't mention anything about the minutes. Instead, he talked calmly about the reasons for the delay between albums. Different band members have their different interests that they've been pursuing, but principally, the main reason for the delay between records was trying to find the right combination of our very diverse influences that would make a record that we were all happy with and that was great. That was a long process. Yet in an interview several years later, Tom Morello would tell a slightly different story. There was so much squabbling over everything, and I mean everything. We would even have fistfights over whether our t-shirts would be mauve or camouflage. It was ridiculous. We were patently political, internally combustible. It was ugly for a long time. So it appeared that not only were they raging against the machine, they were raging amongst each other. For the time being though, that wouldn't stop them from unleashing more politically powerful albums. Subsequent albums Evil Empire in 1996 and The Battle of Los Angeles in 1999 again rely heavily on political themes. The title for Evil Empire came from a speech given by Ronald Reagan when discussing what was the Soviet Union. Yet Rage Against the Machine used that phrase to imply the US could be equally labeled as such. The image of the second record was a little more ironic, considering if you look very closely at the boy's face. To us, he symbolizes the power structure in the US, and if you look at him, he's smiling as if he's in control. But if you look deeper into his face, you see that he's afraid because he knows what's coming. He knows that poor people in the US are not going to continue to suffer in the way that they are suffering without taking action, and we feel that picture captured that very well. And the Battle of Los Angeles, released in 1999, was no exception to the band yet again attacking another trait of the American system, this time the financial sector. Sleep Now in the Fire would be the second single released from the record and would almost get the band arrested. A music video for the single was to be filmed outside the New York Stock Exchange. Rage were to simply play their song and Michael Moore would direct the video itself, but things quickly got out of hand. Several hundred people had turned up to watch Rage play. However, Michael Moore had only obtained permission for them to play on some steps in front of the Federal Hall. 
and as soon as the band finished playing, Moore was escorted away by police when he shouted, take the New York Stock Exchange. According to Tom Morello, a couple of hundred people managed to storm through one set of doors before security doors came crashing down, shutting down the stock exchange for about 30 minutes. Rage Against the Machine saw this as a small victory, but to what end? Did millions of US citizens wake up to the corruption Rage wanted to expose in America? Doubtful. This stunt, however, most likely helped to keep the Battle of Los Angeles on the Billboard charts for a while longer. This record spent 51 weeks charting in total and peaked at number one, making Rage Against the Machine the biggest politically active band in America at the time. But even this wasn't enough to stop them from watching it all come crashing down. Rage Against the Machine started out as a political band, and it all seemed to stem from the experiences Tom Morello and Zac De La Rocha had growing up in America. From their own words, they have essentially said that America is one of the most brutal countries to ever exist in society, and that the country was founded on racism. They have also accused the US of ignoring the poor whilst the rich get richer and turning a blind eye to racial inequality, whilst also directly implying that US forces such as the police, army and government officials actively participate in white supremacist groups. They have repeatedly said how passionate they are about shining a light on injustice wherever they see it in the fight for a free and fair world. Well, how passionate can you really be if you decide to give up that fight? On October the 18th, 2000, Zac De La Rocha announced his departure from the band, and Rage Against the Machine were no more. I feel that it is now necessary to leave Rage because our decision-making process has completely failed. It is no longer meeting the aspirations of all four of us collectively as a band, and from my perspective, has undermined our artistic and political ideal. So Zach says that the band had come to a point whereby they could no longer function as a team or even make decisions together, but not from a political point of view. And as Tom pointed out, it had gotten to the stage where Rage were having fist fights over what color their merch was going to be. This no longer sounded like a band that was focused on spreading a political message, and many people started to accuse them of simply taking advantage of the very same capitalistic system they had been fighting so hard to bring down. After Zack left though, the rest of Rage Against the Machine formed a new group. It would become a supergroup, with Chris Cornell from Soundgarden as the lead singer. Audio Slave would be the name of that band and for the most part, they had nothing to do with politics. This also brought into question Tom Morello's commitment to his original political cause. If you were so passionate about defeating what you consider to be evil, why not start another political band or simply find a replacement for Zach De La Rocha? We were very fortunate with Audio Slave. It was our collective belief that for a band to find its greatness, it has to be authentic. When Tim, Brad, and I originally formed Audio Slave with Chris Cornell in 2001, it was my intention that it would be even more political than Rage. But it soon became clear that wasn't the direction we wanted to go. The principal difference between Rage and Audio Slave is not politics. The music in Rage is very James Brown and hip-hop based. It all comes back to the one. In the entire catalogue of four Rage Against the Machine albums, there might be zero chord changes. It's relentless, but with Audio Slave, to provide Chris with the harmonic interplay that would allow him to weave great melodies, we had a very different sonic palette. You know, songs like I Am The Highway, Like A Stone, or Be Yourself were chord based. That pushed us and made for three exciting records. Rage Against the Machine's final studio album, Renegades, would be released in the same year Zach left. 
However, this would be a covers album. It featured no original music by the band or any original lyrics, political or otherwise, from Zach De La Rocha. And to add insult to injury after the devastating events of 9-11, a program director at media company Clear Channel issued a memo to all of its radio stations with a long list of songs that he had deemed to be lyrically questionable. The list contained 165 songs, mostly listing just one song per artist. Rage Against the Machine, though, were labelled as all songs. Clear Channel later denied that it was an outright ban list and claimed it didn't even come from their head office. Regardless, this was essentially censorship. It stood against everything Rage had been fighting for. Now though, it didn't really matter as they had already given up the fight. Rage Against the Machine have since reformed and disbanded two more times, most recently in 2024, leaving everyone to question who now will be the voice for the voiceless. 